Yeah. All right, Dr. McGregor. It's uh, noon straight up, so we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good to see you. Hopefully, you've been uh, invited to a pop or water, but we have an open kitchen, so whatever you can find, you are obviously welcome to. And uh, we'll jump right in. This is Dr. Kirk McGregor, who's been uh, here with us physically in the past, but now is with us virtually speaking. And uh, so I'll give you a chance to give a greeting and we'll check the volumes and everything and also find out how many folks are joining us online in addition to who's in the room. Welcome to, welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that you've come out to hear about this topic of how to best interpret 1 Corinthians 14, 33 to 38. And I'm really surprised and gratified at the reception that my article has gotten so far. That's, uh, that's good to hear. Uh, quickly tell me about how Dwayne is doing and your wife, Laura. Everybody's in good health and doing good. Dwayne is doing fine. He's just about to start kindergarten in a few weeks. And Laura is, I think, starting her, um, well, she's about in the middle of her second or third year as pastor at Lyons Presbyterian Church. Lyons is about a half an hour drive from where we live in McPherson, Kansas. I hear you. That's terrific. Tell me uh, a little bit about your uh, other research that you're doing. What are you interested in these days? What are you working on? When you were here, I asked you what you do for fun, and uh, you said, I write research. Uh, I write yeah, I do. That's true. Do research. So, so I've got, I've got three projects on tap right now. First is a textbook entitled Contemporary Theology, which will be released by Zondervan this November. So I'm really looking forward to that coming out. I think the subtitle, don't quote me on this, but it's something like, um, um, classical, evangelical, philosophical, and global perspectives. So contemporary theology, classical, um, evangelical, philosophical, and global perspectives. It's a 38 chapter textbook. And there's also going to be a series of videos where I do one like 15 minute video for each of the 38 chapters that goes along with it. So I hope that the textbook is picked up at a wide number of colleges, universities, and seminaries. It'll be first, yeah. What would be an example of a chapter three? Tell me, tell me just the title. Um, let's see. Um, like a DWF Hegel, Dialectical Theology, um, Evangelical Complementarianism and Egalitarianism. Um, Jürgen Moltmann and Wolfhard Pannenberg, Theology of Hope, um, Paul Tillich, Theology of Culture, um, Early Dispensationalism, Christian Fundamentalism, um, A New Perspective on Paul, so you're getting where this is going. It's hitting yeah. all of the hot button um, movements in theology from 1800 to present. That's great. And a predicted published date? Um, it should be coming out at the um, ETS, EPS, AAR, SBL in November. Wonderful. So I just I just sent back the final set of corrected proofs. So um, I think you can start pre-ordering the book in October. But I'm excited that this is going to be the first time that I will be able to use a textbook that I've written for a class that I'm teaching. So yeah. I'm teaching a class in the spring called Christian traditions, and that's going to be the new textbook. So I'm really excited about it. Okay. Um, articles? Um, well, I've got several articles that I'm still waiting back to hear on. Um, I think I've got five which are currently under peer review. Um, I am one of three co-editors on a book project called Calvinism and Middle Knowledge, and that book hopefully should be coming out in 2019. Um, I am, um, as of very recently, under contract with Palgrave Macmillan to write a book on the Gospel of John. 
um, a historical and theological investigation of John's gospel, and that should come out in 2020. Wow, very cool. That's exciting. Well, we we support and pray for you in those endeavors. Thank so. you so very much. I appreciate it. Uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about your interest in um, writing this article on the 1 Corinthians 14, 33b through 38 as a Pauline quotation reputation device that came out with the uh, CBE in the Priscilla papers of winter of 2018. Uh, what, what was your stirrings or what were the circumstances by which you, you submitted that? Well, um, it goes back quite a ways. When I was doing my PhD at the University of Iowa from 2001 to 2005, I led a Sunday night extended Bible study slash prayer slash watching William Lane Craig debates group, which would run from about 6.30 p.m. to sometime around midnight. We normally left around one in the morning. We always ordered pizza. Um, we were great friends. And I would systematically go through various books of the Bible with my Greek New Testament chapter by chapter. and just explaining, um, expositing each passage, and they ate it up. It was really the most enjoyable Bible study that I've ever led. And when we got to 1 Corinthians 14, um, I was really unaware of the tremendous controversy that exists among evangelical complementarians and egalitarians. But as I came upon this text, the QRD hypothesis, now so-called, just occurred to me naturally. I just thought, well, I'm sure that other commentators have published a great deal on this. This just seems the obvious reading of the text. And so I proposed it that night at the Bible study, and they were like, we've never heard anything like this. And so I began to think, had anyone else done research on this? Had anyone else um, submitted this as an article. Um, is this a prevalent view out there? And um, it was sort of on the back burner. Um, it became a more personal issue for me as a result of my wife and I meeting and falling in love and getting married in 2008 because she is a pastor in um, the Presbyterian Church USA. And she was very happy to fill me in on the debate between complementarianism and egalitarianism and how raging it was. And I really had never actually experienced that growing up in um, the Anabaptist tradition. Church of the Brethren have always been open to both genders serving in ministry. So I wasn't really acquainted with um, the divisive nature of the debate. And um, I, once I found out about CBE, I got on their mailing list and attended some of their presentations at ETS. And a few years ago, I heard Philip Payne, who is one of the world's leading textual critics, give a paper on 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 38, that I understood why he proposed his thesis, but I didn't think the thesis was the best solution. In other words, he reads the passage, which goes like this, as in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate as the law also says, if there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Now, he, as did I, immediately recognized that there was no way textually or historically that that could have been Paul's own sentiment. Now, what he proposes as the answer to that is to say this is an interpolation in the text of 1 Corinthians, namely that it was not part of the autograph of 1 Corinthians, that it was inserted very, very early on in the process. It may have even been the first time that the letters of Paul were collected together in codex form near the end of the first century. And he has to posit the interpolation that early 
because we have a manuscript called P46, Papyrus 46, which dates between um, AD 126 and 138, that contains, indisputably contains, um, those verses. And there are many others thereafter. So I thought, well, I understand why he is insistent that this isn't Paul's sentiment, but isn't there a better way to explain what's going on here? And what occurred to me, as it had so many years ago, is that Paul is quoting there the Corinthians' own position back to them and then turning around and refuting it. It's well recognized by scholars of 1 Corinthians that Paul does this several other times in 1 Corinthians. So it starts all the way back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul says, now concerning the things that you wrote about, and then he quotes for them. Yeah, yeah it is not quite stop now. Let me interrupt before we get into that. Okay, got it. Uh, I want to just back up briefly and talk about the, uh, the interpolation and Philip Payne in One in Christ. Yes. He makes that same proposal. I'd just like for you to reflect on why this book, I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a big dog in terms of his position related to egalitarianism, etc., but he introduces the interpolation the, that, the, yeah. that these passages were not in the original. Right. He introduces that concept and it carried a lot of weight. But you see concern about the evangelical method of saying it wasn't in the autograph itself. I'd just like you to reflect on that for a moment in the ways that yeah. it yeah. was problematic. Um, my concern, well, I'm not so sure I would call it the evangelical method. I'm just thinking about determining what's in the autograph, um, that standard principles of textual criticism would say that if you have a text in the earliest manuscript, and we do, you have it without any qualification in two of the next three earliest manuscripts. Um, Payne makes a lot out of the qualification in the third, um, and you have it in one form or another in every other manuscript thereafter, so that there literally is not a single New Testament manuscript lacking these verses, then it seems obvious that the text was original to the autograph. And if a textual critic not to mention an evangelical, were to adopt his approach, the argument that he makes for saying this is an interpolation. The issue is that you could say that a whole bunch of other things that we know full well aren't interpolations might also be interpolations. Exactly. So I give several examples of this just from the Gospels, where you've got a text which is in say, the earliest manuscript and one or two others, and may not be in any more in the entire textual tradition. And yet, because of its presence in those earliest manuscripts, scholars accept it as authentic. And the variant reading, or the omitted reading, is noted in the footnotes, but there are so many readings which Payne doesn't give a second thought to their accuracy, which would also be subject to saying, well, we don't know whether um, this is really an interpolation or not. If you propose, I think quite speculatively, that an interpolation happened as early as the end of the first century, uh, even though I don't make this point in the article, it strikes me that this is very much the same type of logic that Mormons use when they come to my door and they say, well, do you know that the New Testament that you have now has all of these plain and precious things, you know, removed and all of these things added in? And I say, well, we have the New Testament going back text critically to a very early date. And what 
um, Mormons say yet, um, scholars of um, scripture with Brigham Young have been forced to propose is that the interpolations were as early as Payne proposes for this interpolation in 1 Corinthians 14. And so even though I agree with Payne entirely that 1 Corinthians 14, um, 33b to 35 is not Paul's sentiment, it seems that the way that he tries to argue against it is quite problematic. Got it. All right. So um, the reason I was so struck by the article, and it's at, in some respects the heart of why we're visiting today, is because of what I said in my email, which is that the importance of privileging the text, as uh, A. Piravila, who's a hero of mine from Dallas Seminary, says, is that is that we need to not, in our excitement about the cultural discussions related right, to right. With women, we need to actually look at the text itself and let the text be a kind of guiding yeah. um, primary, if you might say, source in the ways in which we deal with that. And so the ways in which, in which I'm going to ask you to, to do with us, to do with for me, again, uh, in the ways in which you've written it in the article, is to kind of point out for me, and I've got my, um, you know, my my Greek New Testament interlinear in front of me. And I'm going to follow as best I can, but to make such a convincing case, I think that that privileging the text insists on what your gut said to you. Yeah, yeah. Back in Iowa, so that's yeah. What and back in Iowa, as I said, I, I wasn't didn't even think that this was a fight. I wasn't concerned with you know, with women's issues or anything else. I just thought this is what the text says. So um, if anybody wanted proof of that, that I'm not like biased because I'm married to a Presbyterian pastor, um, I have the old files from the Bible study on my computer and they're dated. So you can see, oh yeah, back in 2004, he was thinking this. So yeah. And I'll add that the TEI is not, um, you know, as an organization or institution is not, promoting or promoting a complementary nor an egalitarian. Yes. Uh, you know, I have my personal uh, yeah. perspectives, which most everyone knows. But what I would say that I think is the valid point of the day, and which even my complementarian uh, friends can agree on, is that if we're going to, if we're convinced by your proposal textually, that if we're going to find a complementary position, this is not the text to use it. That's... Yeah, that if, if you're going to be a complementarian, fine, but don't quote this as one of your proof texts. Okay. Well, for the next uh, while, I'm just going to let you roll me through the article, Kirk, and I'll raise my hand if I want to, but I'm going to resist doing so, um, so that you can just work your way through, and then uh, if anyone has questions, either here, and you, you can pick them up online as well down the way, then we'll see if, uh, if we'll engage you for the last 15 or 20 minutes or so. so just so you take the liberty of talking, talking me through these, these textual uh, pieces. Okay. So all scholars of 1 Corinthians realize that in 1 Corinthians, Paul is responding to a letter from the Corinthians. And that he's not very happy about several things that he hears the Corinthians are doing. He's not very happy about their spiritual pride. He's not very happy about their factiousness. He's not very happy that a man is sleeping with his father's wife, um, a number of other things. And so Paul, in 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 7, begins this process of quoting from the Corinthians' letter. And obviously, the Corinthians themselves knew what they had written. They knew their own position. And Paul begins by saying in 1 Corinthians 7, and I've got my Greek New Testament here. Let me turn to it. He says, now concerning the things of which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sex with a woman. End quote. So that's not Paul's position that it's good for a man not to have sex with a woman. That was the Corinthians' position, and he identifies it as such. 
And Paul starts that with um, the words peri da, um, now concerning. And then Paul interjects with dia da in verse two. He says, but because of cases of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. So here you have very clearly Paul giving two grammatical indicators. In the beginning of 7.1, he sets off with the perida, that this is going to be the Corinthians position that he's quoting. And then he reverts back to his own view, which is a refutation of what the Corinthians say in the dia da. Now, there are four other undisputed devices like this in 1 Corinthians. And in these others, you don't have a statement leading off the Corinthian statement. If you were to just read it, you wouldn't recognize at first that Paul is quoting the Corinthian statement. But because he comes back with a strong interjection, then in hindsight, you realize, oh, the clause or the sentence that came immediately before was the Corinthians' own position, and now he's turning around and refuting it. So of the five instances of this device, which I've called a QRD, which just means quotation, refutation device, of the five instances of this, the very first, the foundational QRD, has two grammatical indicators one indicating that he's quoting their position, the other one indicating that he's refuting their position. The other four don't have a first grammatical indicator where he sets off, this is their position, not mine. And he didn't need to because the Corinthians themselves knew what they had written. They would identify their own quotations. But you then have the grammatical indicator afterwards saying that I strongly object to this and I'm laying out in opposition to this my own view. So to give an example, Paul writes, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. And when you see that, you recognize that everything is permissible for me isn't Paul's own view. That should be in quotation marks. And it is in quotation marks in all modern translations of the Bible. It's Corinthians' own position. And we know just from the one grammatical indicator afterward that Paul is turning around and refuting this. So we've got five undisputed QRDs in 1 Corinthians. And with that in mind, you come to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33b to 35. Okay. And you okay. find that here you have not only one question. Yeah. yeah. If you wouldn't mind, just take me to one more of the four. Yeah. Um, Corinthians 14 and point it out to me so I can see it in the passage and in the Greek itself. Yeah. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Um, all things are lawful but not all ooh, all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. So you see that there, if you just start at the beginning of the sentence, you wouldn't know that Paul is quoting the Corinthians, all things are lawful. But once you hit al ooh, then you know, because he's refuting it with his own position. So, the other four, there are two others, as I say, which are exactly like that. Okay. So in 1 Corinthians 30, in 1 Corinthians 14, what you have is not just the grammatical indicator after the Corinthians position. You also have a grammatical indicator which tells you in advance that this is going to be the Corinthians position. So of the five undisputed QRDs, if 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 35 is not one, 
then certainly neither are four of the five undisputed QRDs. And um, because the only one that's better attested is the very first one, the foundational one, where Paul says, now concerning those things you wrote about. Because here, he doesn't say the things you wrote about, but just like in the foundational QRD, he gives two grammatical indicators, one to indicate that he's quoting their position, the other indicating that he's refuting it. So reading this text um, pretty woodenly um, from the Greek, um, hos, as, in all the assemblies of the saints. The women in the assemblies, let them be silent, for it is not permitted to them to speak, but let them be submissive, as also the law says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands in the home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in an assembly. And then immediately after that, Paul throws the interjection A, or, or from you, and you there is plural, we've got to determine the gender of it later, or from you, the word of God went forth, and then he gives another interjection. Or to you men only, did it reach? So in 1436, he gives us um, the grammatical indicator or to indicate what just came before isn't my view, it's some of you guys' view, and I'm turning around and refuting that. Now, what makes this even more powerful is that when you look at the words in 1436 um, concerning who is the you, this is going to be really the clincher. Um, the words for you are plural, the word you in Greek is genderless, so you can't look at a you and determine whether it's you men or you women or you men and women. You need more than that. But fortunately, we have more than that. That in the second half of 1436, Paul says, or to you only, and only, is masculine plural. It's not feminine plural. Now, the importance of that can't be um, overemphasized because if the complementarian is correct that verses 33b to 35 are addressing women, then verse 36 would continue Paul's rebuke against the women. He would be telling the women or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? And in that case, the only would be feminine plural. Mones, not masculine plural, monus. And so the masculine plural monus can only be translated um, only men. And so it should be, or to you men only did it reach. And since in the Greek, um, all adjectives must agree with what they modify in number and in gender, that means that also the first you in 1436 refers to you men. So putting this all together like a puzzle, Paul is saying just strictly on the basis of the text, or from you men only did the word of God come forth? Or to you men only did it reach? And obviously there he's giving a um, sort of a reductio ad absurdum. Obviously, um, neither of those conditions is true. Um, the word of God did not emanate with the men, obviously. And certainly the word of God had not reached only the men. And then Paul goes on to say in 37 and 38 that if you disagree with this sentiment, if you really think that women um, ought to be silent in the assemblies, then you're not just disagreeing with me, you're disagreeing with a command of the Lord. So he says, if anyone thinks to be a prophet 
or a spiritual man. Notice he's still addressing men here. Um, pneumaticos, masculine. Um, let him fully know the things I write to you. They are a commandment of the Lord. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not to be recognized. So Paul is saying, you've got to recognize that you men, the word of God didn't originate with you. The word of God didn't come forth from you. But by refusing to let women talk about it, discourse about it, ask questions about it, you act as though the word of God is only your province. And that is unacceptable. And if you do not allow women full participation in the worship services, being able to comment on, to ask questions about the word of God, then you are not just disagreeing with me, Paul says, you were disagreeing with the commandment of the Lord. You're not genuinely a prophet or a spiritual man, and you should be disregarded. So I think it's one of the most tragic ironies in the history of biblical interpretation that the very text that Paul wrote to emphasize that women should be able to speak and take part in the full life of church services has been used to undermine women's ability to do those things. So that's just the grammar of the text, which to me closes the book on things right now. And what's interesting to me, talking about um, how other scholars have viewed this argument, um, a prominent textbook on New Testament by Paul Actemeyer, Joel Green, and Marion May Thompson introducing the New Testament, its literature and theology, they present my position as the only possible position. They present my position as if it were, you know, that's the only option that's even available. They don't even take the complementarian view or the interpolation view seriously. So just to read, it's sort of nice for me to get other scholars confirmation on this. Let me read, um, this um, in their words. Um, here it appears Paul is ordering a particularly divisive group for women to maintain silence during public worship services. He ends by chiding them that by seeking to dominate the worship services, they act as though they alone had received a word from God. That's the complementarian view. The problem with such an interpretation is twofold. First, until this moment, Paul has not mentioned any problem concerning women dominating the worship services, so it is strange that such a problem would surface now. Second, and of far more importance, the Greek text will not allow such an interpretation. Greek is an inflected language, which means that the gender of adjectives must agree with the gender of the words modified. In verse 36, the word translated only once is, in the Greek text, maxillary. This means that Paul has addressed this condemnation not to women, but to men. The Greek makes clear that it is men who act as though they alone should be allowed to speak, and it is to them that this rebuke is addressed. It is therefore evident that what Paul does here is what he regularly does in this letter. In 1433b-35, to he quotes what some Corinthian Christians have been saying and then refutes it. See 612-13, 8-46, 10-23, 1535, 36, 48. Paul is therefore not telling women that they are not to fully participate in worship. He has already assumed that they will do so, 11, 4, and 5. And there, remember that Paul explicitly says that women are to prophesy in the churches. So Paul expressly says in chapter 11 that women are to speak in the churches, which would be um, another argument that would not be the um, grammatical argument, that would be the contextual argument, that Paul wouldn't, you know, blatantly contradict himself like that. He is telling the men who apparently want to restrict women, the men whom he quotes in verses 33b to 35, that such an attitude is not to be tolerated since they, the men, did not originate God's word, and that they are therefore not the only ones to whom God's word has come, Hence, they have no right to try to bar women from full participation in public worship. Paul knows that women play an important part in the work of Christian communities. The women mentioned in Romans 16 confirm that. And here Paul is making sure that the women in Corinth have the opportunity to continue to do so. 
So, um, as I say, this this view has been um, embraced by a good many other scholars, um, and I'm glad to see that the grammatical argument that I'm presenting has shown itself to be persuasive, such that Actmeyer, Green, and Thompson say that the Greek text just won't permit any other interpretation. So that's just the textual evidence, you know, in and of itself. Um, but the historical evidence really serves to, to sort of hammer this home, the historical and the contextual evidence. So contextually, it would be very odd for Paul to contradict his own sentiments earlier in the letter when he says explicitly that women are to pray and prophesy in the church. And for Paul to say that in 1 Corinthians 11, that women are to pray and prophesy in the church, which means that they're speaking, they're speaking quite openly, doesn't seem to make sense that Paul would then later say, as in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches. That doesn't make any sense. Um, now, historically, you look at this quotation here in 33b to 38, and the question is, where is the authority for this quotation? Whoever is giving this quotation, where are they locating its authority? And it's very clear. It says that this is based on the law, as the law also says. So this is trying to quote the law to the effect that women are to be silent in the assemblies, that it's not permitted to them to speak, that they are to be submissive. If they want to learn anything, they should ask their husbands at home. The law is the basis on which this is being proposed. And you begin to scratch your head for a second and say, wait a minute here, the law can't be referring to the Torah or even the Old Testament in general, because there isn't anything in the first five books of the Bible, let alone the first 39 books of the Bible, which say any of those things. There's nothing in the Old Testament that says women are to be silent in the assemblies. There's nothing in the Old Testament that says women are permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive. And there's nothing in the Old Testament that says that if they want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. As a matter of fact, the very um, idea of the assemblies, that was the standard term used in rabbinic Judaism for the, um, for the gatherings in the synagogue. And the synagogue wasn't even an institution at the time that the Old Testament was written. So this law that's being appealed to as a source can't be the written law. Rather, this is a reference to the oral law, the oral Torah. During Jesus' day, the Pharisees especially, but other groups too, like the Essenes and the Zealots, they believed that there was an unbroken chain of oral tradition going back to Moses, which had been passed down by the men of the great assembly, as they were called. We would call them the Sanhedrin, means the same thing. And so the Sanhedrin had this belief that many of their oral traditions, which really one rabbi would teach at some time and then it would be repeated, and then it would be repeated, and then it would be repeated. And by the time of Jesus, many people thought that this went all the way back to Moses, rather than, as all scholars realize, that this doesn't go back to Moses at all, that this just originated in the rabbis during the intertestamental period. And so um, one theme running through all of Paul's letters is that Paul says that we as Christians are not in subjection to the oral law. Heck, we're not even in subjection to the written law, much less the oral law. And Paul has very harsh words elsewhere in his writings, um, especially Galatians, where he says, look guys, if you're following the oral law, 
if you're keeping special feasts and festivals and seasons and years, if you're trying to do all of these things, then you are not standing in the freedom for which Christ set you free. He says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I, Paul, warn you that anyone who keeps these laws, at least the oral laws, that they have cut themselves off from Christ, they have fallen away from grace. Now, for Paul to say, that if anyone keeps the Jewish oral law, the oral traditions of the rabbis, and bases their practices on it, that they have been alienated from Christ, that they have fallen away from grace, it is simply unthinkable that Paul would quote the oral law here three times, and we know exactly where this quotes the oral law, um, we have the relevant quotations in um, the Mishnah. Um, the Mishnah is where the um, let the women in the assemblies be silent comes from. We know from Josephus in Against Apion that um, the oral law also said that women are not permitted to speak in the assemblies, but let them be submissive. We know from Philo of Alexandria that um, the oral law also said that women who um, want to know anything in the synagogue, must be quiet and wait until they get home to um, ask their husbands. And so we know from these sources, from the Mishnah, from Josephus, and from Philo, that everything this quotation says um, comes directly from the oral law of the rabbis. You know, it's sort of like chapter and verse from the oral law of the rabbis. And interestingly, even Payne admits this in his, his chapter on 1 Corinthians. So um, even though I have to say, even though I disagree with Payne on this one aspect of Payne's um, wonderful book, um, that's the only part of it I disagree with. I mean, I love the rest of it, <laughs> but you know, you're, you're never gonna find someone that you agree with, some theologian or um, textual scholar that you agree with 100% of the time if out of, you know, 30 what odd chapters, there's only one that I disagree with, you know, that's like a 97% batting average, you know, you're not going to do better than that. So um, I just disagree with him on that one issue, but I have nothing but respect and admiration for, for Payne's work. And I think it, I, I would commend it um, to everyone. Um, so with, with 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is, um, here quoting some of the Corinthians' position, and they are basing this view that women are to be silent in the assemblies from the oral law. Now, does this make sense in light of what we know about 1 Corinthians as a letter? Yes, it makes perfect sense, because in 1 Corinthians, we find in the very opening chapter that there are Judaizers in Corinth people who would insist on following the oral law in order to be saved, um, as there were Judaizers in Jerusalem. So one faction of Judaizers said, we are the faction that belongs to Cephas. And it was this very faction that contested heavily Paul's apostleship, so that they claimed Paul's not a real apostle, Paul's not really one of us, he's not keeping the law properly, and they, by contrast, denoted themselves as the super apostles. And in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul has to go to great pains to defend his apostleship from these Judaizers in the Corinthian congregation. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul has nothing but unkind things to say about these um, Corinthian Judaizers. Um, he says that they are false workers, they are deceitful workmen, that they are masquerading as servants of Christ when they are really servants of the devil. And so given the fact that this text, um, that um, complementarians think Paul's expressing his own view there, that this is three quotations, it's a patchwork of three quotations from the Jewish oral law, and that's not speculation, we know exactly what the quotations are. Um, given that, and given the fact that he's that, that the text appeals to the oral law as the foundation of this, um, 
if you're a complementarian and you think that this text makes your case, then you would not only have to ignore all of the grammatical problems I mentioned, you would also have to think that Paul here uniquely founded a binding principle of church life on the oral law, even though Paul, as a continuous theme throughout his letters, has said, you're not to follow the oral law, you're free of that. Those are just basically superstitious practices, and anyone who follows them is cutting themselves off from Christ. Hmm. Wow. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, a reflection that I have is that um, I'm really glad we did this orally. It was very helpful to walk through the article, and I don't know if it's my learning style or uh, maybe a combination of your great communication, but a lot of things you cleared up, and I appreciate it. And now I can go back to the article and reread it with fresh eyes. So I, so I appreciate the very format that we're having this in and appreciate you helping me. Uh, a couple of quick things. One is um, I'm missing for some reason uh, the end of verse 38, but if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. What, how, how is, what does that mean in context? Um, but if anyone um, agnoi, um, that would be um, not to recognize. So, but if anyone does not recognize, and he means does not recognize this, what he said, agnoietai, he is not recognized. So Paul is saying, anyone who does not recognize that this is a command of the Lord, you're not to pay that person any mind. You're not to recognize them. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that feels very different from the word ignorant then, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. That my translation. Thank you. Um, the back up. The, what would be the explanation as, as you understand it, if you could help me with the translation um, in verse 36, who must you, and then as you pointed out, uh, manus, male. Men only, yeah. Only. What would be the translator's reasoning? I mean, it just seems pretty violent in, in light of what you said to leave off and say only in the translation. What would be their argument for doing so? How, how, how would they assume? What, what thinking would be possible to assume that it's okay to leave male or men off of the word to you only and make it generic it's just that the argument that i've given hasn't crossed their minds it's not any intent on their part it's not any ill intent or they're trying to do violence to the text or that they think it shouldn't be there it's just that this is a relatively recent argument that i'm making and that um if I, if I may, very, what I'm very, thinking. Very, very many times in the Greek New Testament when you're translating, you could wouldn't more woodenly translate than you do all sorts of words. And that's one reason why um, I tell students who learn Greek from me, I say, um, when you read the Bible just in English, it's like watching a black and white television. When you read it in Greek and in Hebrew, then it's like, watching it in color. And there are just going to be various things that you miss. Um, and I would say that th th there are many aspects of, of scripture, which um, unless the translator is going to be, or the translation committee is going to be, you know, painstakingly, woodenly literal, then just as a matter of course, um, manus does mean only, and there's not, there's not usually reason to, you know, pay attention to what the gender of only is. And so they just sort of glide by it and just write only. You know, it hasn't crossed their mind that maybe there's a significant theological point that Paul is making by having that word masculine singular. And what will be interesting to me 
is what later translations will do now that this argument is out there, if they will start rendering this, or to you men only did it reach. So I'm curious as to how this is going to go forward, because now that the case has been made, that the gender there is on purpose. It's not just, you know, sort of an incidental feature of the narrative. And it's really not the translator's fault if you're not looking for it. Usually the gender is just an incidental feature of the narrative. So. Okay, that, that helps me to understand. So oftentimes the gender is in, in the word anus may, may in other places be neglected or, or not. No, yeah, no. yeah. Because my surprise was that, for instance, in the NASB, and I assume it'd be the same in the ESB, who are trying to create the kind of, uh, you know, plain, plain, speaking it plainly that they would actually highlight it, but you're saying that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. But in this case, you think it's intentional in the ways in which he is. Right, talking. right. It, the reason why I'm, I think it's intentional is because in the quotation of the Corinthian men's position, the, the Judaizers among them, um, the feminine plural, them, is used, for it is not permitted to them, outtikes, feminine plural, to speak. And so there's a, a huge contrast between the feminine plural, outtakes, in 1434, and the masculine plural, manus, in 1436. And so um, the fact that you have that that disparity, and the fact that you're like, oh yeah, but as I say, if if you're not looking for this, if you're not thinking along these lines, and you're just thinking about translating the text, um, you're almost certainly going to miss this. Um, I remember um, very recently when I've done editorial work, and um, different editors look for different things. So there are content editors, there are style editors, and a lot of times content editors don't catch stylistic things and stylistic editors don't catch content things. Um, and so if you're there on a translation committee, you're not there to do the work of the biblical interpreter um, or to even think about, well, um, what's the author really trying to say? It's just translate this from language X into language Y. I follow you. That's really helpful. Uh, I do have uh, a question then about the implications that uh, are in First Timothy, uh, those passages, and if there's any connections that you want to make. But before we do that, let me just ask if any of the group here have questions, and I'll invite Belinda to see if there's anyone online that uh, that also might want to interject. So, anyone question, comment, or a comment, something else? Kind of hard for us in a language that does does not have uh, adjectives uh, that modify the noun. It's very hard for us to uh, see this, and it's yeah. easy for the translator to not see it at all. This is very very important uh, observation. That I, it's actually this observation that because Greek doesn't use quote signs at all, so uh, what you have to do is be alert to the rhetoric rhetorical style. Paul, and actually scholarship the last 10, 15 years finally has really pointed that out before. Isn't that right? I think that is right, yes, that there has been an increasing emphasis on Paul's rhetoric, where really the rhetorical strategies of Paul had been really completely overlooked until quite recently. So if you read older translations of First Corinthians, then you'll find that they don't even set off what now all scholars recognize as QRDs as QRDs. Those things read as though they're Paul's own position. So if you read the New King James Version, for example, it will quote these as, it won't quote them, it'll just put them as Paul's own position. Um, certainly the King James and you know all the translations that came out of the Reformation are the same way. Very good. Kirk, you may uh, remember Sinjin, who uh, had supper with us, he and his wife, when we were here. Yes, yes. Good to see you again. I think you made a, a pretty good argument that women should be able to inquire and ask questions. Is this a good text to support women teaching? It seems like teaching or 
positing the word true, does, it seems like it's just missing. Yeah, um, I haven't thought about what one should be able to do constructively with this text. Um, and I wouldn't have any problem with someone saying based on the argument that McGregor and now others are making that this certainly would be more on the side of women being able to teach than otherwise. But since the passage itself is only dealing with the matter of speaking, and we know from Paul, if we're just going to be you know, sort of rigorous in our boundaries here, that Paul has said women can pray, women can prophesy, and now he's saying that they are allowed to speak, that they're allowed to discourse about the word of God. Now, the larger implications of that, I think I'll let others draw. Um, there's a lot of controversy there. I really don't want to get into that. Um, I've already thrown myself into this controversy enough. But um, yeah, that's I, I, I think that, that this passage would be on the wavelength of those who would want um, women to be able to do anything that men are able to do in churches. It's in that wavelength, but I don't think the text itself goes that far. Very good. That's an important thing. Great question. Anyone else? Comment? Question? Okay. Make, uh, if you would, a connection of any that you would like to then to um, what might certainly be happening in the first Timothy passage, but it's okay to take a pass as well if you, if you haven't done the kind of work that you want to do without time. Well, um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I haven't. Um, I, I really pursued this inquiry independent of any thoughts on first Timothy, but as I said, I, I agree with what Philip Payne has to say about this matter. I think that He's absolutely correct that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that um, his pointing out in 2.12, um, I do not allow a woman to teach, nor, and then you've got this verb, oftentimes, and Oftentimes, um, in all of its uses, and it's not just Payne who makes this argument, several others have as well. Um, it interestingly doesn't have, I don't know anyone in like secular biblical scholarship who disputes this. The only people I know who dispute this are complementarian evangelicals. But that um, the term oftentimes means to um, seize unauthorized authority. It's always with the connotation that you're seizing an authority that is unauthorized. You are usurping someone's authority. That the, the, the contrast to oftentimes is not um, to have authority, it's to have properly recognized authority. So it's a question of this is not properly recognized authority versus properly recognized authority. And the fact that the two participles um, are linked, didas kind and oftentimes, when participles are linked like that in Greek, it's expressing one thought unit, not two. So it's not trying to say that I don't allow women, A, to teach or to have unauthorized authority. He's saying, I don't allow a woman, a woman to teach um, in virtue of taking unauthorized authority. That's the point. And so um, that once one understands um, what everyone recognizes, including other passages in the New Testament, were going on in Ephesus, to which First Timothy was written, um, Ephesus was the major center of the cult of Artemis. And in the Artemis cult, um, interestingly, women were perceived as far superior to men. Um, it was thought that men were just basically you know, ignoramuses who um, needed to be led um, by women, and especially women who had esoteric knowledge. It was a part of Ephesian culture for all young women in adolescence 
to be initiated into the um, into the um, Artemis cult. And so um, it's not at all surprising that when false Gnostic like teaching is infecting um, Ephesus, that it is, is specifically many of these women who already view themselves as having superior authority over men, um, that they would try to um, take unauthorized authority in the church and teach their own views. And Paul is there saying, no, I don't permit this. Um, and contrary to um, women being superior to men, that's why he quotes the Adam and the Eve thing. He's not doing that to like blame women for all you know sin everywhere. He's trying to say, look, um, you've forgotten. You're in this just as deep as the men. Um, you know um, um, that Adam was not deceived, but the woman, um, having been deceived, has come to be in transgression. And one thing that's interesting about two fifteen to me um, is that. Um, the, the last um, the last verse uh, of First Timothy two, I actually think, is oftentimes a bit mistranslated, um, and the reason why I say that is, um, it it says, but but they will be saved through the childbirth, tes technogonios, the childbirth. Now. I think, given that Paul is talking about Adam and Eve and the curse, that the childbirth, he draws this connection elsewhere in his letters, is the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah, that they will be saved through the childbirth, men and women alike, if they remain in faith and hope and holiness, in faith and love and holiness um, with propriety. So... Um, I tend to think that um, 215, um, thinking that that is saying that women will be saved through childbearing, which seems very misogynistic, like you've got to bear a child in order to be saved. Um, I don't think that's what the text is saying. Um, I don't think that that appreciates Paul's rhetorical strategy and um, what the New Testament commentator Richard Hayes has referred to as metalepsis, where metalepsis is when you're citing one theological theme, like the Adam and Eve narrative, you're citing several parts of that narrative. You're trying to evoke the narrative in the reader's mind, and you'll talk about parts of that narrative that um, you don't have to, you know, pound somebody over the head for them to see that. It's their present, and so that you've got Adam formed first, then Eve, Adam not deceived, woman deceived, but um, they will be saved um, through um, literally the childbirth. That's, you know, woodenly what taste technogonios means. And there, you know, one thinks immediately about, well, um, the seed that would come from the woman who would crush the serpent's heel, as Paul says in his other letters. So I think probably the reason why um, some translations, the most frequent one I use is the NRSB. I think probably the reason why um, that this has been thought of as just verse 15 addressed to women and through childbearing as the NRSB reads is that it's assumed by many um, as this is sort of opening another can of worms that Paul didn't write First Timothy, that um, the pastoral epistles um, of First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus that Paul um, wasn't actually the author, and that this represents one of Paul's disciples after him. Now, I don't think that that view works. I think that more probably, Paul is using someone as an amanuensis or as a secretary, who he said to the secretary, look, you know my views, please put them into writing, and then send it back to me. I'll approve it. If it's all good, we'll send it out. Um, amanuenses or secretaries had that kind of freedom in the first century world. Uh, we know that. And um, so I, I would agree that 1 Timothy 
is of a very different literary style than the so-called undisputed Pauline epistles, Romans, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, um, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon. But that this only indicates to me the use of an amanuensis. Um, um, perhaps even Luke, the writing style of Luke, matches quite nicely the writing style of 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. Luke would have known Paul's own thoughts and that makes makes very good sense that Luke would have drawn it up in the one to actually pen it so that it reads like something that he can, but that Paul read it through, said, yep, that's my thoughts, I'll sign it off, we'll send it. So um, um, try to remember who recently argued that um, Luke was um, the amanuensis for the pastorals. Luke Timothy Johnson at Emory University and his most recent commentary on the pastorals, um, he made that argument. Okay. Wow, very good. Uh, do you recall off the top of your head the Hayes Metal Lexus that you referred to, where, what that source is? Oh, my goodness. Um, let's see. Well, I just want to read more on Yeah, this. yeah. Um, I'm thinking the title is something like The Interpretation of Imagination. It's something like that, um, or I mean, imagination is definitely there. That's that, that's going to be close. I bet if you type in Hayes' interpretation of imagination, um, I don't think interpretation is what right. that that's the one I, I think is wrong. But I, you should be able to Google it and find it. For sure, but that's where he talks about metal lessons. All right. Well, very good. Well, that wraps it up uh, for us here. Uh, before we say goodbye, I'm going to use, I'm going to talk to you and make a co couple of commercials. But before I do, <laughs> but before, do you have any questions of us? No, nope, I really enjoyed being with you. I feel like I'm just there in the room with you, standing exactly where I was before. I have very fond memories of this place, and I hope well, we keep in touch and we keep things going here. I do too. It, uh, it worked really well. I want to tell you that, uh, first of all, uh, you've given us permission to record this. And uh, given um, how well it worked, we can also be hopeful that the trajectory of that will be that we will be able to put it in some kind of a format. And I can email that to others so that they could catch up on the conversation. Wow, that would be great. Say again? That would be great. Yeah. So, so as a result of that, like your Molinism lecture, uh, which is at our website, um, we'd love to uh, be able to share that. So we'll do our best to get that done and, and let those know when it is so that if they want to watch it again and refer their friends, they can. And then uh, do you know the name Carolyn Custis James? I do not know that name. Okay, well, she's going to be with us in September. She's written a book. Uh, her husband is Frank James from Biblical Theological Seminary, formerly at Reformed. Okay. Uh, He's at uh, yeah, he, he, he was the, he was the co-author of the second volume of Church History published by Zondervan, if I remember correctly. Okay. And uh, she's an, a, a biblical studies major, the first actually from Dallas Seminary when they began allowing women. Uh, and she's coming to uh, her book, Half the Church is a Christian worldview and talking about Edsar Connecto and uh, those kinds of things. We're partnering with an organization here locally called Created Female, and she's coming in September uh, the 14th. She'll be similarly like we are today from 9 to 3 uh, here in probably another space nearby to accommodate the crowd that we expect. Uh, so anyway, uh, September the 14th, 9 to 3, Carolyn Custis James talking about her book, Half the Church. And so Looking forward to that. We look forward to an opportunity to uh, read your further writings. Are you presenting at ETS a paper or so? Yes, yes. I'm presenting, um, let's see, three times in six days or something like that. So I'm doing, um, I, I'm at the very beginning of, of ETS. I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a paper um, defending Molina's doctrine of super comprehension. I, I said when I was with you that that's what I wanted to present on the next EPS, and indeed that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm also doing, um, because the theme for ETS is the Holy Spirit, I'm doing um, a paper on um, the Holy Spirit as God the Evangelist in Latin American pneumatology, um, which is basically um, 
the paper is kind of a book advertisement because most of the material in that paper is going to come from the book, which they will then hopefully, after hearing the paper, <laughs> go down and purchase. Um, and then I'm also giving um, giving a talk at the AAR as well. Oh, that's terrific. Very good. And for those who don't know, ETS means Evangelical Theological Society, and EPS means the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and that's being held in Chicago, correct, this year? In Denver. In Denver this year. Yes. I'm very thankful. It's one of the few places that you can get to relatively quickly from, you know, central Kansas. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yep. On you. All right. Well, uh, our, our very best blessings to you. Thank you for your work and keep it up. And thanks for today. Oh, you're very welcome. And the same back to you. Very good. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you. All right.